Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm the Rocky Mountain Chapter. I'm really happy to introduce today's session. We've got a really uh, exciting topic today, talking about 100 gigabits per second over HFC networks and beyond. And we have a very distinguished speaker that we're um, presenting or having come present to you today. So, Dr. Alberto Campos. So before we get into uh, right into the webinar for today, um, just wanted to kind of show off a little bit of the chapter's pedigree. So, um, just talking about you know our mission, why we're here. Um, we were we, we did a pretty good job cleaning up, cleaning up, uh, <laughs> cleaning up the awards for 2021. Um, so I think this is a testament to how outstanding our group and our chapter is able to execute and what we're able to deliver to our membership. Uh, so, you know, why are we doing this? You know, basically the short answer to that is we're trying to en enrich the lives of our members. We really want to encourage the ongoing growth, development, and connectivity to the industry and to our community. Um, so, yeah, there's just some stuff to show off there. So, if you are in the right place and you're with the right people, um, it's time to get involved, time to get engaged. So. Um, here's a slide. I'll just leave this on here for a moment. So in case anybody is not aware, um, this is how you can renew your membership. So Comcast is part of the CAC program. So um, makes that pretty straightforward. Everybody else has to log into their SCTE account and start the renewal process. And I guess this is a good reminder since we're kind of approaching the end of the year, just making sure that everybody is either set for next year or has that at the back of their minds um, that they need to get their memberships taken care of for next year. So. Um, just a reminder that uh, memberships don't usually auto renew, so just make sure you're going in and checking that out to so get access to content like this, what we're bringing you today, and our fabulous speakers as well. So, um, we we offer certifications as part of like what we're doing here. You know, we we're, we're trying to help provide knowledge in the industry, get some uh, recognition for the skills that you will. Um, essentially tuck into your belt here with these programs um, want to help people get ahead in their careers. Um, so if anybody is looking or interested in our certification incentive program, we have some actual financial rewards, not just beyond the bragging rights and the attaboy, attaboy and gata girls and the kudos that we'll send your way. Um, but we actually also have some real financial incentives for you to take these tests, get, get these certifications um, and better your, your cable career. So if anybody's interested in that, please reach out to us. We're more than happy to show you the ropes and, and show you what you need to do to get involved and um, start on your certification process. Um, just, just kind of like a, you know, just a little eye chart here for y'all to see. Um, you know, we do everything uh, through the installers, uh, up through our uh, plant technicians and, and uh, uh, maintenance people, <clears throat> excuse me. And then also, like, finally up to our head end and our engineers. So we, we've got something for everybody here. Um, so, um, and again, if folks need some more information, we've got this stuff up on our website. Um, so you can get a little bit more information about what kind of certification programs we offer in these areas. And finally, before I introduce our distinguished guests, um, just wanted to offer some ways for you all to connect with us. Um, to help, kind of help keep your finger on the pulse for what we're doing in the Rocky Mountain chapter in this area. Uh, we've got a Facebook group, we've got a Twitter feed. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can reach out to us over email. And we've got our, of course, handy dandy website, um, which kind of houses all of our stuff. So without further ado, um, I'll just do a little introduction for our speaker for today. Dr. Campos is joining us from Cable Labs. Um, pretty uh, it's going to be hard to do this, but uh, industry giant, I would say, um, Dr. Campos has done a lot over his 20-plus uh, uh, years in the cable industry, working on things from specifications, uh, prolific patenter, uh, author. Um, you know, Dr. Campos has been very active in the community um, throughout his career here, and um, it's, with, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce him today um, and be, be able to share his time with our chapter. So, Dr. Campos, thank you very much for joining us today. Appreciate your time, sir, and uh, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, Andy, and uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. 
in spite of the snow that we have uh, outside. So, very good. Okay, so um, the title is just a snippet of what uh, we're going to talk about today, right? Uh, it's an example of, of what we are going to talk about. It's, it's not just a hundred gigabit over coax, but is uh, certain approaches that we can use, not just for that, but for other things that we could have in mind for our networks. So this is work that I have done with my colleague, Lin Chen, along with other colleagues at, at Cable Labs. And um, it's uh, kind of like in the future. So don't think about, I'm going to change my network today, but let's think about what could be possible years down the road. So uh, let's, let's look at from that uh, perspective. Okay, so our cable networks have uh, changed a lot, right? Initially, we're just video networks and we built our networks many years ago with that in mind. And because of the flexibility of our networks, we have been able to do a lot more, right? Put the data and uh, is used for connecting to wireless, to businesses, this much more. But it started as a video purpose network. Keep, let's keep that in mind as we think about how we transform things later on, right? And um, let's see how we can leverage that infrastructure that we built many, many years ago to take the most out of that. Let's see how we can squeeze more out of this uh, HFC network. Thanks to you, our network is living longer, right? Maintenance, advances in maintenance have been such that now our networks are living longer. There is less of a delta between uh, how much it takes to operate optical networks and, and coaxial networks because you have been more efficient at, on the coaxial side. But let's keep all that in mind as we explore this journey towards uh, what can the future bring us? So this is a uh, Nielsen's chart, right? Uh, if you're like an old, if you're an old timer like me, you remember 1981 when we had uh, 300 baud uh, case uh, modems, telephony dial-up modems, and uh, so this chart represents what were the highest uh, service tiers. And uh, this is true in 81, 82, and it's also true today. Comcast is delivering three gigabit per second services, right? at and five gigabit per second services. So this chart is still valid for the highest service tier that we are delivering. And if you extrapolate this chart just a few years down the road, means that by 2029, you're going to deliver 100 gigabit per second services, right? So we have to figure out how do we evolve our network to, to do that. So um, it's just for the highest service tiers. Not everyone will get 100 gigabit per second, but, but the network should be flexible enough to, to accommodate for that, following the same, the same uh, philosophy, right? So what are the tools that we have to increase capacity. We have three basic tools. We take advantage of segmentation, right? Node splitting, uh, smaller nodes. We take advantage of higher efficiency, uh, higher order modulations, uh, uh, and we take advantage of uh, more spectrum, taking advantage of more spectrum, right? And this is true not just for cable, this is true for for DSL is true for mobile. In mobile, we don't call it segmentation, we call it uh, cellularization. We have uh, macro cells and we have, we put small cells to increase capacity. Here we, in HFC, we have smaller nodes. So these are tools that, uh, that we, we use. We have used segmentation significantly, right? We have used higher efficiency also significantly. We'll go with that into a little more detail. And we also have used spectrum increase, but 
we're going to focus a little more on this spectral increase side of things in this presentation. So from an efficiency perspective, remember when we started the digital transport, digital video transport, we were doing 64 quant, right? That's many years ago. And uh, eight bits per symbol. But DOCSIS 3.1 has the option for 16K quant, right? So the constellations got more complex, more elaborate. And because the constellations got more elaborate, we had to have our plants cleaner, better signal to noise ratio in order to maintain that. And that became a big challenge to do it with traditional analog optics. And we changed uh, strategy to do a distributed uh, um, access architectures. So we changed our network to, to achieve a uh, highest performance on, on board. So to some extent, from a higher efficiency perspective, we have reached uh, almost a, a peak that we, that we can on the quartzel side of things. Now, segmentations, fiber deeper, right? When we started building HFT networks, our networks were, for the most part, 500 household tasks serving areas. And when we needed more capacity, we split the nodes, and more recently, we have uh, embarked over splitting nodes to much smaller size, N plus two meaning node plus two active in cascade, and sometimes N plus zero meaning no actives, no amplifiers following the fiber node, right? So uh, there are uh, many areas that have N plus zero uh, architecture. So this is segmentation. Now, this is helping us because we can dedicate the same amount of capacity for fewer number of people, right? This is the, the segmentation package. Now, <clears throat> let's explore spectrum increase. Our infrastructure closer to the customer is coaxial based, right? And uh, this chart that you see shows cable attenuation. It shows cable attenuation all the way to 10 gigahertz. You see RG6 has significant attenuation, uh, half inch cable, 0.625, rigid cable has less attenuation, performs uh, better. So, so we're going to have to figure out under these conditions, how much can we get out of coax? Right? We have drop cable, RG6, we have rigid cable in our feeder networks. Now, there is another problem with coaxial cable. When you start transmitting at higher and higher frequencies, you have what is called uh, the cutoff frequency. So, in coax, you have. Um, uh, capability to transmit, but when you transmit at much, much higher frequencies, other higher order modes start being generated and they interfere with your transmission. And that generates a limit in how high can you transmit. It's uh, geometry related. So, so a large uh, one inch uh, rigid cable is going to have a lower uh, cutoff frequency and a smaller RG6 cable is going to be have a much higher type of frequency, right? It's related to the geometry. For example, here you see in this graph, you see the, the, these arrows. These represent uh, sine wave, uh, the electric field. You have the one, uh, one cycle, right? One cycle, one wavelength. When the wavelength gets uh, smaller and smaller, meaning the frequency gets higher and higher, then this wavelength is comparable to the size of the, of the coax. When you have, this is just ballpark, when you have this uh, wavelength being comparable to the size of the diameter of the cable, the formula expressed this in more detail, but just in course, when you have this wavelength comparable to the size of the coax, then you start having higher order modes that interfere with transmission. So these are our limits, in addition to attenuation. 
So in this table here, you have that for a half an inch cable, your limit is about 11 and a half gigahertz. RG6 can reach up to 29 gigahertz and a 0.75 inch cable, 7.7 .7 gigahertz, right? In our distribution, we have a lot of half an inch, 0.625 uh, cable. So, so 10, 11 gigahertz is uh, it's a, a limit I think that uh, we can uh, we can manage in this portion of the network. So, so, so this is our environment. This is, this is uh, uh, our resources to get uh, to get um, bits out of it. So, this is just a cluster segment that you see here, and um, you have some tabs that are closer to the amplifier, closer to the fiber node, and some tabs that are further away. Right? You have cable modems that are hanging from tabs that are closer to the fiber node. They're going to have better carrier to noise ratio performance. They're going to be able to get more capacity out of them. And the ones that are farther away, they're going to be able to get less capacity out of them because they have lower carrier to noise ratio. Right? If you have a shorter drop cable, they're going to be able to get higher performance because you have a lot of assignation in drop cable. If you have a longer cable, your current to noise ratio is going to be worse, you're going to get less performance, right? So we have been just describing this a little bit. Later on, we'll go to the numbers, right? So, so, but we're going to keep that in mind, right? Based on the characteristics of the channel, you're going to take advantage and you're going to transmit capacity in an optimal fashion. This is the high-level story, right? Now, we're doing some of that today in DOCSIS 3.1 with profile, uh, uh, multiple profiles in, in DOCSIS, right? We have uh, uh, the capability is that if you have a, a benign environment, you're going to be able to get a transmitting the profile that gets you a lot of capacity. And if you have a lower carrier to noise ratio, you are in a profile that transmits less, but you have that flexibility. So to some extent, we're extending this concept that is already introduced in DOCSIS uh, 3.1. So um, this is a theoretical analysis. This is a, a coaxial segment with uh, multiple tabs, uh, four tabs. Um, spacing is 150 feet, and you have cable modems that are hanging from uh, from these uh, coaxial segments with different drop lengths, right? And the table on the right has uh, how much capacity could you get out of the cable modem that is hanging out of that particular uh, position in the in the in the coaxial segment, right? So you have one cable modem that is able to get seventy four gigabits per second over um, this is over uh, 10 gigahertz, and uh, one that can get 145 gigabits per second, right? So the one that had uh, that was probably closest to the node and had uh, um, shorter drop was uh, had, was in a benign environment. They could get a lot of capacity. The one that was further out with longer drop. Would get less, right? So, varying conditions. If you average out all the cable modems here, uh, you have um, an aggregate capacity uh, of uh, 112 gigabits per second. Let, let's remember that now 112 gigabits per second. This is at this point theoretical simulations. So, now This chart shows the frequency response for every individual cable modem, right? So you have cable modem four and cable modem seven, right? They are closer to the node. They have shorter drops. They have good benign environment. They're going to get a lot of capacity. You see that the response over these 12 gigahertz is quite good. It's fairly flat. 
but you have cable modem 9, cable modem 11. They are further out from the node. They have worse carry to noise ratio. So they're going to get um, the option of uh, a lower portion of the spectrum because, because of the, those channel characteristics. So the characteristics of the channel varies a lot. And um, how do we optimize taking advantage of these resources, right? At this point in our industry, we have uh, provided services such that everyone should be capable of getting the same service. But here we're going to take uh, some flexibility in figuring out how we how we deliver the services. So let's let's uh, let's discuss this in detail. So. If you allocate resources for the different cable models, depending on their carrier to noise ratio, you're going to see that all of the cable models are going to get fairly good capacity, right? So it just happens that cable modem four uh, is getting the higher portion of the spectrum because it had a benign channel. Cable modem nine that had the long drop and was further away than the lower portion of the spectrum, right? But you manage this, and when you optimize this in this fashion, based on carrier to noise ratio, you notice that the aggregate capacity was not 112 anymore, but it's 142, right? You're you're allocating in an intelligent way, your resources. You're distributing your resources in an intelligent fashion, right? So this approach allows you to get more out of your resources. If you, if you do the distribution differently, then you're going to get less, but this allows you to get more capacity out of that. So there is a 27% increase from allowing everyone to access uh, all the frequencies. How do you sell that? I'm sorry? <laughs> How do you sell that? You don't have to. No, that's the point, because the old method, the old method means that there's a disparity. I can't get what you get because you're close. In this method, um, I can get what you get because I'm getting spectral efficiency where I can read it and you get it where you can read it. Right, but if a sales guy goes out there and put out a television stand, you're going to sell 55 gigabits per second or 50 gigabits per second. So you find an average. You, you, you find, a, a, you find a, a, you're not going to sell 100 gigabits per second, but you're going to sell a subset and, and anyone could get 50 gigabits per second. You're ahead of me. Let's okay. let's finish there. Just a second. Sure. Okay. So, so here, Everyone got uh, almost 12 gigabits per second, and uh, the aggregate was uh, 14, uh, 142 gigabits per second, right? So it's uh, using 10 gigahertz worth of spectrum. Now, you're going to say, well, in 10 gigahertz, I'm going to have a dynamic range because, because uh, the attenuation in some portions of the spectrum is going to be much higher than the attenuation on the other portion of the spectrum. How do you solve the dynamic range problem? So, but let's examine the dynamic range according to the allocation of the of the cable models, how, how you have allocated frequency, right? So it's true that there is a significant dynamic range here, vertically. But if you look at who was allocated what portion of the spectrum, then the, all the cable models are confined in a smaller chunk of, of power levels. So distributing the resources in this fashion allows you to solve your dynamic range challenges. This is for implementation, right? So this helps you with uh, implementing the system. Okay, so how we this goes to uh, Mark's uh, question, right? How do you sell this? It's not just how do you sell this, how do you implement this in a cost-effective fashion, right? Because uh, 10 gigahertz receiver might be very expensive, but uh, 
let's see how we can uh, get it to a lower cost. So, um, and, and the solution is your receiver is not a 10 gigahertz receiver at one point of time, but you select how much is cost efficient to just get capture that chunk of this spectrum. Just like wireless does, right? You capture the tune and you capture the chunk of spec. So, for example, you could have a couple of cable modems can be capturing the higher portion of the spectrum, a couple of cable modems can be capturing the lower portion of the spectrum. So you divide that. The cost of the cable modem is related to how much processing you're going to have to do. If you're going to have to do uh, 10 gigahertz worth of processing, it's going to be more expensive, but if you just limit to three gigahertz worth of processing, it's going to be much less expensive, it's going to be practical. So the proposal is not to have capability of 100 gigabits per second peak capacity, but a lower capacity that is cost effective, 25 gigabits or 40 gigabits, some lower capacity that is cost effective based on how much spectrum you're capturing and processing. So you need tunability, but we know how to tune things. We have done it for years and years, wireless does it for years and years. And let's talk about wireless a little bit. Um, wireless has been improving, has been increasing, Wi-Fi and, uh, and mobile have been evolving, and they have been increasing the amount of capacity they have been processing. So we can continue to borrow uh, advancements from wireless, from mobile. Right? You have that uh, uh, Wi-Fi 6, uh, in, in theory, they can do 9.6 gigabit per second processing and Wi-Fi 7 uh, even more. Same thing with uh, mobile technologies. There is a lot of capacity. So you're going to have that capability that a few years down the road, is going to be available. So let's not think about this is impossible, but we're just targeting this is going to be possible a few years down the road based on the evolution of technology, right? So here we're talking about RF over coax. We have RF over wireless. These are like sister technologies, right? And we have a more benign environment. So let's take advantage of that. So if we optimize what is the capture bandwidth and the amount of processing that we have to do, then things become practical. So this is a uh, 100 gigabits per second or 120 gigabits per second as an aggregate, although it could be 25 gigabits per second or 40, 50 gigabits per second as peak per use capacity. Right? So let's think about this way. Now, um, how, what are the challenges that we have? What, how do we change our current systems? In DOCSIS, the way that we schedule capacity is uh, not frequency selective. We just, we have um, our, uh, our uh, subcarriers, we go um, up and down from lower frequency to higher frequency without any selection of what frequency you choose, right? And I think that if we are moving towards an environment that has very high attenuation, like going to much higher frequencies, we have to have frequency awareness. We have to be able to be more granular how you select frequency. So this is how we schedule capacity today in DOCSIS in the downstream, right? We go one symbol, we go all the frequencies, the next symbol, we go all the frequencies, and then we go to the next profile and so on, right? And what we need to do is, need to be more granular how we can, how we can uh, uh, divide our uh, scheduling in chunks of frequencies. So, so this can allow us to have more granularity, more flexibility from a frequency perspective. So we need frequency awareness in our scheduling. A smart scheduler that is going to figure out this cable modem should be scheduled from this frequency range to this frequency range. And this other cable modem that uh, has a much benign uh, environment can 
get the, the low, the higher frequencies so that you can optimize this strategy. So to make an analogy, essentially every modem in the network gets a hearing test. And based on the outcome of the hearing test is what we transmit to them. So if there's low frequency loss, you don't use that. And if there's high frequency loss, you don't use that. You use what they can hear. That's true. Very good. That hearing test is a ranging process. Our ranging process has to be more elaborate, has to cover a larger frequencies, chunk of spectrum, so that we said, what is this cable modem capable of? So that you can you can use that in in your scheduling process. Very good. So so we need this uh, uh, schedules. Now um, now let's talk about the time. Remember we talked about how our networks way back way back long time ago were designed with just uh, video in mind. They were designed with video in mind, and uh, and from a technical perspective, um, we had to receive video within a narrow power level range, right? Analog video forces us to build our hardware, to build our networks in such a way that facilitated the TV receivers to receive within a certain uh, level range. Now, that was many years ago. These uh, challenges that we had uh, 50, 60 years ago are no longer valid. Wireless doesn't, has a lot of uh, flexibility to, for this level range. So, so we had this challenge many years ago and we solved that through hardware. And uh, meaning that we had Caps that were uh, closer to the amplifier or to the fiber node, and uh, they have high uh, cap values. And as you go down the segment, the cap values decrease. And the purpose was so that everyone would get about the same level so that you can facilitate this uh, distribution of video that require this uh, narrow variation in, in power levels of the receiver, right? So we started helping our, our system with our hardware design, but we have evolved a lot since then. Now, um, we're proposing a single value tag. meaning that no longer you have 29 dB, 26, 23, and so on, as you go down, right? Because we are demanding from our cable modem the possibility of allowing a little variation in power, right? Wireless does that all the time. Why can we do that, right? And what's the advantage of that? The advantage of that is that you could allow some cable modems to benefit from a higher uh, performance because they are in a more benign environment, and some will will get uh, uh, maybe lower performance because they don't have a benign environment. So instead of having for let's say for a four port uh, caps, this 29, 26, all the way to 8 dB cap values. Let's just have 14 dB cap value, and the last is a splitter, so it has to be A, right? So one cap value. But what you do here is you take advantage of the advancement in technology that you don't have to stick to this uh, uh, level of, uh, uh, limitation because technology has advanced. You are reducing your inventory significantly. Right? You just have 14 dB tab values for most of your four way tabs, right? The trucks have just a much easier inventory to carry. If you have a 2 port tab, it's 11 dB. If you have a 8 port tab, it's 17 dB, right? Drastically simplifying your inventory. 
Now, how is this related to this topic of 100 gigabits per second? Okay, you'll see. Um, this is just the um, Some some points about this uh, single tap value. If you have a single tap value, you can afford not to have removable taps. Right? If you have a single tap, what should be you replace taps? Right? You think if, if you are in a in a uh, four port type neighborhood, you just you just use that, right? So we go. And get rid of removable taps. This is extremely advantageous because we have very few types of taps. We can have one design for aerial, one design for uh, underground. So you don't have to have this uh, rotating 90 degrees. Uh, to adjust your taps for aerial or underground, right? But because you have just a few taps, you can afford that. So there is no switchable connectors inside. That limits your frequency response, right? You can design things now with a microwave philosophy, just a, a fixed board. And, and then you're not going to have this, uh, um, in uh, when you have uh, the central conductor come in, you have, uh, Inductances, it's it throws. You have to do now heroics to to deal with a higher frequency. But if you have just an enclosed tap and you don't have these other issues, then you can design for much higher frequencies. So um, the center pin has frequency limitations, but your design also now can uh, evolve towards. Uh, microwave strategy. You can get rid of the FR4 substrate and just use Duro, use some of the substrates that are used for higher frequency. Go away from using, just using lump element uh, resistors and so on. Let's just use chip resistors and, uh, and uh, capacitors within a uh, microwave uh, design philosophy, right? Because now we're targeting much higher frequencies. But now you have these enclosed taps. And ideally, you also change your KS connectors. So get rid of your KS connector. Just use uh, connectors that have a fixed uh, fix pin so that you can reach those higher frequencies. So, so these are significant uh, uh, these are significant changes. But uh, a few years down the road, the needs of capacity may make sense. So, single value tap, remember this. So, we have to chat with this. Interesting concept. So, and, uh, and the tap is enclosed. So, from an interference perspective, it's, it's much easier. Takes longer to replace a tap when it has a lot of components, but if it's a single box, then it's much easier. You lose any port to port isolation, but you still know what I'm value. You are always ahead of me, Mark. Just don't skip it, man. <laughs> okay. Um, so look at this design. This is the traditional tap design. So you may have a, you may have this uh, splitter, you may have some port to port isolation, probably the same as today from an isolation perspective. But now you can afford alternative designs. Right? If you have now the capability, you are no longer bound by everyone should be receiving your output at the same level. So now you can have, instead of having this uh, split in four like that, you can have them in cascade. And if you have them in cascade, your isolation will drastically improve. So, and uh, you can have similar things for, uh, for other values, right? Maybe, Maybe eight, uh, eight uh, uh, four taps are not optimal, but from an isolation perspective, I think that uh, this is uh, very advantageous, right? So we'll forget about 
receiving at the same power level. That's critical because that was our inheritance from very early on that we have been carrying on for many years. Okay, so this is just a summary, the key, the key um, characteristics of single, uh, single, uh, single tab. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention is that when you remove a tab, sometimes you have um, um, to maintain continuity. You have um, you have a connecting uh, wire, right? That also has a very bad uh, uh, frequency, high frequency performance. It's almost like you you lose your high frequency performance. It's almost like in defaming everything. So you also move away from that because you don't have removable uh, face plates, right? So this is a significant change from how we have been thinking about uh, uh, dealing with, uh, with taps. So, but this could enable higher frequencies effectively. So up to this point, we have been talking about uh, analysis and simulations and models. But this has also been demonstrated in the lab. So in the lab from uh, 500 megahertz, uh, almost to almost 12 gigahertz, we have implemented the system that had uh, four taps, 150 feet between taps. And uh, the first uh, below three gigahertz was traditional DOCSIS 3.1. Above three gigahertz, we had a pseudo DOCSIS 5 because of availability of components in generation of system. But here we have demonstrated an aggregate of 114 gigabits per second over ports over this uh, over this system. So we did it in the lab and um, uh, and uh, it has been in this case a 450 segment, but you're going to see the impact of, of the length. Uh, in the next uh, the next uh, few slides. So um, we were talking about just one segment. So you can think about maybe it's just n plus zero. But in the first chart of cable attenuation, you show you saw the difference between RG uh, six uh, performance versus rigid cable performance. The rigid cable performance is much, much better than RG6. So if you have a shorter drop, or if you have no drop, meaning when you go from amplifier to amplifier, you have no drop, you just have rigid cable. When you have no drop, there is a neg neg negligible impact. So you can go more than one segment. More than one segment, you can go N plus one, N plus two. You can go even beyond N plus two. But when you go beyond N plus two, then you start impacting whether you're going to reach an aggregate of 100 gigabits per second, but maybe 90 gigabits per second. So, but this is just uh, just the, the concept. You can you can take it beyond even N plus two. You see this uh, line here? This is a line of one of the cable models that had a short uh, drop and uh, there was a minimal performance. So you can extend this beyond N plus one, N plus two, using the same philosophy. Okay, now this is a night test. Okay, get your glasses. You're going to tell me what is the difference between one and two. <laughs> one and two. Okay, what's the difference? It one more time. One yeah. more time. You, you, okay. You changed the footage to 145 on the second chart. Yes. Okay. Why, why did you do that? Okay. So number one, very good. Number one was attenuation per 100 feet. Number two is attenuation per 145 feet. <laughs> Look at the horizontal axis. Number one is 10 gigahertz. Number two is five gigahertz. Right? So now what's the implication of this? The implication of this is that you can use this for 900 uh, 
feed um, 10 gigahertz uh, system, or you can use this for nine tap segment, 1350 feet and a five gigahertz system, right? So when you split nodes to smaller and smaller nodes, it's expensive to have too many nodes. But if you have, if you want to reduce the number of nodes by in extending the length of your segments, you can do this. So this approach of using um, um, this uh, frequency uh, aware allocation of resources can help you extend the length of your segment. So you are trying to extend the length of your segment, right? Because you want to have fewer nodes. When you go to n plus zero, you don't want to have 18 child nodes. You want to have less than 10 child nodes, or even lower number of child nodes. You can take advantage of this philosophy of, of frequency aware allocation of resources to do that. Did you model this with the idea that you could, for example, go from the first to the second amplifier with an express cable and then do it old school like a trunk and feeder where you have feeder makers come off your amplifiers and you spider backwards in one direction and go this way in the other direction to fill that 1,350 feet? <clears throat> and what would happen if you had an express for the next amp instead of perhaps in the cast? I haven't modeled any scenarios. So these are just like the building blocks. Okay. And I'm showing you this. But but what you mentioned, I think it's it's worth uh, quantifying because you can take advantage of this. Well, you might be able to go higher in frequency if you express to the next amplifier and then went. That's true. In your because you're kind of making a hybrid of both. Yes. Yeah. So because your networks may not be uniform. May not. I'm <laughs> not uniform. <laughs> okay. Now. We have a lot of capacity, right? 100 gigabits per second, even more than 100 gigabits per second. Now, how do we back for all this capacity? So, it's this is where our evolution in our optical access network comes in. You may have uh, heard this, but in Kevlar, we have been working on computer optics for several years now. Um, we evolved from analog optics to, to gigabit Ethernet to a remote file, remote Wi-Fi device, and by using baseband optics, right? But that baseband optic is the IMDD, just intensity modulation, zeros and one, turning on and off the on and off the light. So in analog optics, because we needed to transmit at this very high carrier to noise ratio that, the, that was demanded by 4K QAM or 16K QAM, our lasers had to transmit at much, much higher power levels. And when you transmit at much higher power levels, then you, if you have multiple of these in one fiber, you start entering into nonlinear operation. And you could not transmit more than eight or 16 uh, optical carriers. So you had to reduce the power. And to reduce the power, we evolved to this uh, gigabit Ethernet to remote file to remote Mach 5. But uh, gigabit Ethernet is just on and off uh, turning modulation of, of light. It's not very efficient. And you need uh, filtering to, to manage all these wavelengths. So we have been working on coherent optics. Coherent optics resembles uh, transport over coax, over HFC, right? In DOCSIS, we have constellations, QAM, right? This is QAM over optical carriers. In, in optics, in fiber optics, we have the opportunity to transmit in two polarizations, right? So another multiplexing and capacity enhancement techniques, right? The highest capacity has been achieved and using coherent optics over fiber. Highest efficiency, less receiver sensitivity because you have a local oscillator and, uh, but has been expensive because it has been mostly used by uh, long-form. Long-form, you go 
don't care too much about costs, but we are working on lowering the cost. We have a lot of uh, uh, innovations on, on lowering the cost of uh, computer optics. And we have implemented in cable that's point to point computer optics and uh, specification for 100 gigabits per second, 200 gigabits per second. And uh, now we are embarking into coherent pawn. And coherent pawn is really beautiful if you think about long term, um, because uh, you have a lot of capacity. And if you see, for example, traditional pawn, traditional pawn is uh, maybe 20 kilometers distance, and uh, you have uh, uh, 32 homes uh, or subscribers at the end. So you have a split of one by 32. And uh, if you have just 20 kilometers, many times you have to have repeaters and, and so on, right? But because of the sensitivity of coherent optics, you can extend your reach, not to 20 kilometers, but to 80 kilometers. And your split instead of 32, 512. So it has significant possibilities. And we're starting now with the spec of 100 gigabits um, for coherent pond, but uh, future, this is just the beginning, future iterations will have likely 200 and 400 gigabits per second. So with coherent pond, you have the technology to backhaul all this capacity. So if you if you combine coherent optics with uh, these uh, high capacity quads, you can easily carry all this uh, traffic to your uh, to your hub, right? So I advise you to follow our our achievements in in coherent optics. So that means that you have these uh, smaller uh, HFC nodes. With high capacity, and then you backhaul that with a coherent pawn, right? Coherent pawn doesn't exist yet, it's in a specification uh, state of evolution, but uh, a few, few years down the road, you'll have it. So the two technologies will, will mature at some point and will help each other. So, so, and once you have, we talked about before that this 100 gigabits per second was an aggregate capacity for coax, right? Not peak capacity because it may be too expensive to, to have a cable modem that captures the entire 10 gigahertz worth of capacity. But um, when you have subscribers, not all of your subscribers need 100 gigabits per second. Some may just need 25 gigabits per second. So maybe you can have that uh, through coax, you have 25 gigabit per second service or 40 gigabit per second service. If you have one subscriber that uh, needs 100 gigabits per second, you just extend uh, CPON fiber connection to that particular subscriber to address those high end users. Because once you are penetrating deep with fiber, it's just a, like a long drop service to the high end user. So combining coherent pawn and this extension of uh, cable that we call it extreme cable, uh, I think that uh, could be an opportunity. So, um, so this concludes the presentation, but there are main points, right? There is still a lot of capacity out of coax. Not every does it make sense for every uh, area to evolve to fiber to the home? You have invested a lot in coax. There may be still money left in, uh, in your parcel plan. And uh, we have presented uh, some approaches to, to get more out of your coax. And it's not just achieving 10, gigabit, 10 gigahertz worth of uh, spectrum, but it's also tools to extend the length of your coaxial segment so that you don't have too many smaller nodes uh, to, to build, right? And we talk about how to redesign the tab in a new environment, just a single value tab, and uh, how to take advantage of coherent pond to backhaul all that capacity. So, so 
Um, and all of that started really for us when we thought about what if we wouldn't have started with uh, this uh, legacy, same power level video distribution, but just let's be free of that. So, so thank you very much for for uh, attending, and uh, and this is a uh, work in progress. So I'm looking at questions online. I haven't seen any specific questions online, but I have one for is rhetorical maybe. Do you ever see like a special span of cable we need to replace? We should be thinking about becoming Heliax Flipped web guide technicians for one span, or is that ever going to be like you know thinking? You go into that high frequency. If we had a replacement cable, would it ever be different than a hardline cable? Probably not. I, I think that if you replace your KS connector and if you replace your PAPs that you're replacing, I think that goes a long way. And uh, and uh, from a technical perspective, there is not uh, a drastic uh, learning curve. We have learned a lot in this last 30 years. And we have, we're constantly learning and I think this is just one more uh, learning step. The change is not significant, I think. No question. So you, uh, you kind of model downstream, right? Downstream mobile. Yes. That one tap thing makes sense to me, but for the upstream it doesn't. You're right next to the node, off the load tap, how is that loading going to work? Yes, very, 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 very good question. So this is this is one of the limitations. So you have to assign for this to work. I think you have to assign the lower frequencies to the upstream mm -hmm. so that things are going to work. So um, because you're going to have to overcome attenuation and uh, and. Uh, it's just challenging from a perspective. So if you assign uh, the upstream uh, from zero to two gigahertz or from zero to three gigahertz, uh, you you have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of capacity. So so this this is a this is a good point. So this is optimization of the upstream of the downstream. The upstream is still uh, going to be limited because it's very expensive. To have this uh, high power upstream transmitters in, in the box. Well, the, the kind of the inverse would also apply, right? So if I'm right by the amplifier in the return path, I could use the really high frequency to come back. If I'm 1300 feet down the span and I need to get back, then I'm going to be somewhere in the 500,000 megahertz range because that's what I can afford to send back and have it arrive. So it would, it would be kind of an inverse of that yes. that you showed, right? I think that uh, it's worth exploring different use cases. For example, you have uh, connectivity to radios, or you may have uh, something else that is hanging from the telephone pole. When it's hanging from the telephone pole, you have access to the rigid cable. The rigid cable is the one that performs well at higher frequencies. So you could have some, if, if you have a lot of capacity that is originating directly toward the rigid cable, then you can take this uh, at the uh, higher frequencies. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a um, trade-off uh, exercise. And then you have to be cognizant of your cutoff frequency depending on what kind of hard line you have out there, right? Because I think you said 750 was seven gigahertz. Yes. So presumably, when you're closer to the subscriber, when you're dealing with that. Um, 0.75 is not that uh, prevalent, right? So most prevalent is uh, 0.625, 0.54, and, and so on. Yeah, but but so this is part of your intelligence scheduler. The intelligence scheduler is going to have to decide how to how to allocate resources, also based on knowledge of indirectly of uh, of your cable, right? Because the type of frequency may be eight gigahertz, not 11 gigahertz. One. In your, okay, in your test setup, um, yes. you had amplifiers. Where, uh, what kind of amplifiers did you have that were amplifying up to 10, 12 gigahertz? Okay, sweet. So, <laughs> we use, uh, this is a good point. So our setup 
was not a 75 ohm setup, was a 50 ohm setup. And on the 50 ohm setup that we had, we use uh, microwave amplifiers that were readily available. The total composite power was still 65 dBmV out of those 10 gigahertz. So this is this is uh, this is what we're using today. We use the cables that mimic the losses of RT6 and half inch cable frequency versus so we use the 50 ohm cable then? 50 ohm cable. Okay. No, I'm not saying that the industry has to change no, no, no. 50 ohm but, but in your test setup, in, in test setup, ohm setup. 50 ohm setup, yes. Right, but your cutoff frequency of these cables, the smaller ones like the SMA connectors and stuff like that, okay. you're probably using the good end, it's probably better than what we have with the coaxial cables at this point. So they were end connectors that were larger, but but uh, it's uh, it's uh, the the length of the connectors. Even though if, if we would be using SMA, the length of the connectors are small enough so that uh, it's not enough to excite the higher order modes. You need some length also to to excite these higher order modes. Jesus. Alberto, you mentioned um, coherent, coherent foam, yes, um, and then some changes on the doxes. Um, where are the silicones? I mean, everything that you say is public, right? This is an SCT event. There is vendors. There is everybody here. So, where is the? Where are the silicon manufacturers with respect to the new doxes or respect to the changes that? Is this is it? Four point one, five point zero, five years from now. Uh, what is what is their status? So. I have presented this to some vendors, but uh, this is just like information, like I'm presenting to you. So we're not, uh, you are not fully engaged about, let's change this, let's let's follow this. So we're just uh, uh, exploring these new ideas. You are one of the first ones. So to hear. we're using the frequency generators to, to get through the, this, this path you mentioned. I'm sorry. Obviously, you have a DOCSIS motor that goes up that high, so we use the frequency generators right there. So we use, uh, we use, uh, um, it was DOCSIS below 3 gigahertz, and above 3 gigahertz was pseudo DOCSIS, and we use a vector signal analyzer to receive the constellations, and we extrapolated the capacity as well. So above 3 gigahertz was not really DOCSIS, was DOCSIS like. Yeah. Well, Plants. Oh, it's going to change the way operators think about building plant. And I think a lot of us think about, oh, how are we going to upgrade and modify our current, what we have now, right? Let's leave the spacing alone. We don't want to put any more pens in. We don't, right? Don't disrupt anything. But I think it's very interesting for a green field. You can do whatever you want. So we have come to the point in evolution of technology that we should let our the intelligence of our endpoint, the flexibility of our endpoint, solve these problems that we have been solving in the past through hardware, through uh, the way that we have built our networks. Now we have more flexibility. And if you compare with wireless, right? Wireless has overcome all these uh, challenges, right? Uh, and we have a more benign environment. So uh, one of the points is that we can leverage a lot of the wireless advancements that are coming on. More questions? Oh, great job. Thank you. Thank you.